Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas. I am an associate professor of philosophy at Providence College. This is the fifth in a series of lectures on McIntyre's Dependent Rational Animals. And here we are covering chapter five, uh, the uh, whether the non-human animal world is impoverished or not. Uh, so you may recall that we are involved in a series of theses that McIntyre is arguing uh, throughout this book. And the first thesis is that the non-human animal world and the human animal world share a variety of features that help us to understand uh, human life and uh, human language. And as part of that, we have this three-step argument uh, that we're looking at. Uh, there are features of human languages that we looked at in lecture four of this series, and then arguments that move from premises about language to conclusion about the inabilities of non-human animals. So in lecture four, we looked at uh, analytical arguments about uh, human language, and we looked at four particular arguments, two from Davidson, one from Stitch, and one from Searle, and then gave responses to those. Uh, we are still in this segment of the argument, but now we're turning to the continental tradition. So analytic and continental is a, a broad uh, categorization of uh, two approaches to philosophy in the uh, Western philosophy. Analytic is usually associated with uh, the English-speaking uh, world or philosophy uh, in the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, and Canada. And then the continental, of course, would be continental Europe. Uh, it's more about the approaches, though, in how we look at uh, the arguments. So analytic philosophy is more focused on uh, the uh, definitions of words and how we use those words. And continental is more about the experiences that we might have. So we're moving from the sort of looking at the meaning of words to looking at the experience of our world. And then after this, uh, we will talk about how these arguments bear on characterizing intelligent activity of dolphins and other non-human animals. So in this lecture, we're looking uh, at Martin Heidegger as our uh, example of continental thought on this issue, uh, primarily because of his arguments uh, regarding what it means to be human. Uh, and this is laid out primarily in his uh, famous book, Being in Time, which was published in 1928. And there he gives this concept of Dasein, which is his concept for uh, human beings in some sense, uh, although it, it could presumably apply to other beings uh, that we just haven't encountered. But let's put that aside for a second. So uh, there are different ways that we can think about what Dasein, Dasein means. Um, so. It means that we are the only beings that takes being itself, uh, including our own being, as a question. So what does it mean to exist? All of those sorts of questions that philosophers are made fun of for asking. And Heidegger says that for much of modernity, uh, particularly in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, philosophy forgot about these kinds of questions. And what he wants to do is return to that question. And he says it's interesting that uh, human beings and philosophers have forgotten to ask what is existence and what is the meaning of our own existence. Uh, and I think that's interesting that this comes back after uh, the First World War, and again will return uh, after the Second World War to kind of take that question uh, as important. Another aspect of Dasein is the taking as structure. Um, and here he says that for us, other things exist as something to human beings, right? The, the, the rock is a rock, right? We take it as something. They have a particular kind of presence. So the rock might be, uh, you know, we can see if the rock is hard, uh, maybe immobile or maybe mobile. What size it is affects the way that we take it, right? So a small rock is something that we take as a thing that we can skip across the uh, water, whereas a large rock might be something that is in the way uh, of us mowing the yard, right? And part of this deals with an essential feature of uh, the being of Dasein, which is to care, right? We have projects in the world that we care about, and the objects appear to us, they are taken as something uh, in relationship to our care about the projects that we have, okay? 
Another way of thinking about uh, Dasein, though, is it's a way of life shared by members of some community, right? And in particular, some human community. And this isn't just about the biology, but about the way that we act in the world, right? It's a particular kind of way of being in the world that um, is not necessarily biologically based, but is based in our experience as a, a particular kind of uh, a being, right? So we can put these together as uh, putting being into question, right? That's the first thing. And taking as, right? A work, working back and forth with each, other, with each other. They're not in conflict, right? Because when we put our being into question, part of what we're doing is we're taking our being as something and the being of other things as something. Why does this right rock exist here the way that it, that it does, okay? Uh, and when we take something as a particular thing, we're, we're questioning its existence as that thing, right? We're considering its existence. So these two things go uh, hand in hand uh, together in some ways. Now, this is a lot of philosophical framework to get to the particular kind of point that we want. But it's important to understand that, that Heidegger is making this distinction about what Dasein is, right? And he's gonna use that to distinguish us from non-human animals. And so where uh, human animals are uh, in the world or are part of the world or world building, sorry, world building, non-human animals are poor in the world. And the reason that they are poor in the world is because they lack the as structure, right? The lizard there doesn't consider the rock as a rock, right? It's just a place where the lizard is having to sun himself. And if he were on a different rock or a different area, sand maybe, right? The lizard would be sunning itself there, right? So the lizard is captive to its environment. And when the grasshopper walks by, the tongue goes out and grabs the grasshopper and pulls it in. So there's just a stimulus and response and it doesn't take the, the grasshopper as a grasshopper, right? It doesn't signify anything to the lizard. Uh, so the being of the grasshopper or the rock or whatever the, the lizard happens to come upon is not disclosed, right? The being does not become a question for it. Why is there a grasshopper here now? What is the purpose of this grasshopper, right? For human beings, for a Dasein, that those questions do arise, okay? Uh, and we have environmental ethics and food ethics that make us think about, well, what kinds of, of animals are right to eat? Uh, is it good to eat this kind of animal? What kind of plants are poisonous, right? So we, we disclose the being and the as structure at the same time so that we are not captive to the environment. So when we're sitting on a rock, right? We might think, oh, I'm happy that this rock is here for me to sit on. Or we might be looking at the rock thinking, this is, you know, blocking the path and it needs to be moved, right? Lizards do not do that. And a part of that is because they simply don't have language. And it's not that they don't have concepts. It's that they lack, for Heidegger, they lack the capacity to form concepts, right? And that's part of the as structure there. Dasein forms concepts because it has the as structure, right? This is a rock because the the concept of rock means something to me because of the kind of being that I am that puts things into questions. Uh, so the lizard doesn't have any kind of, of as structure like that. Now, it's important to recognize that a Heidegger does use a variety of uh, examples from the non-human animal world. The unfortunate thing is that most of those animals are the um, uh, less uh, capable animals, or how we, however we might want to characterize this, animals that, that are uh, less in their capacity to engage with the world. So he's not looking at dogs and cats, for an example. He's not looking at dolphins. But he characterizes, so this is part of McIntyre's crit critique, Heidegger characterizes all non-human animals as such. So he's saying that dogs and cats and dolphins are exactly the same as the lizard in that they do not have an as structure 
uh, to engage with the world, right? The, the world doesn't exist and doesn't come into to question its existence, doesn't come into question for the dog and the cat or the lizard, right? Uh, and so what Heidegger does is he ignores, right, the way that various animals explore the world, not just react to it. So we might think about the lizard just reacting to the world, right? The grasshopper comes across it and then eats the grasshopper. But many animals explore the world, okay? And they do so in ways that are belief supposing and belief guiding, right? So we talked about a dog in the last lecture going from tree to tree looking for the squirrel it was chasing, right? It has a belief guiding intention that is going to get that squirrel, okay? Uh, and uh, it's moving from tree to tree to figure out where that, that squirrel is. And it has beliefs about why the squirrels in the chart. Sorry, it has beliefs that the squirrel is in a tree, etc. Uh, cats are similar, right? I, I've seen cats chase, uh, hide, and, and capture uh, birds before, right? And so they have a particular intention, right? And that intention is guided by the, uh, that, the belief that here's something that I'm going to eat, okay? So uh, many animals do discriminate. They do recognize particulars. They do respond uh, to different beings as food partners or playmates, right? Many of us have seen the, uh, uh, the way that particular uh, dogs, for instance, react to their uh, human coming back from being away for a long time. Maybe they were lost at sea or they were in, in uh, you know, away at sea uh, serving in the army and they come back and the dog just goes incredibly uh, um, uh, emotional because they recognize that particular being as their human, right? And so there's a discrimination there. Uh, and we can talk about other kinds of discriminations that cats and dogs make, but also dolphins and other uh, animals. Now, part of the problem here is that what uh, Heidegger does is he's not, he doesn't just mischaracterize the non-human animal, animal world. He also mischaracterizes crucial aspects of Dasein, right? And so uh, even though Heidegger recognizes that we have a bodily comportment to the world, he doesn't recognize that that bodily comportment for the human animal is at first an animal comportment, right? And so here we react to the world when we are babies, we react to the world as, you know, food or some other, you know, way that we um, relate to the world that is pre-linguistic. We don't have words around this, but yet we do have beliefs, okay? Um, and our independence from that world is, is never a full independence from animal nature. Some things remain unchanged in our lives. How we react to various uh, aspects of our world is always going to be dependent upon that animal nature. And what we do is we learn to have more refined discriminations of those basic animal comportments that are part of our early life, right? And so what happens is we are re redirected to be certain kinds of animals through a partial transformation of our animal nature, okay? And so we take that animal nature more into consideration how we relate to uh, the world. So our ass structure does allow us to relate to the world differently, but it builds upon that animal, uh, basic animal bodily comportment to the world. So there is a continuity between the non-human and the human animal world. And this uh, relationship uh, involves a relationship between our pre-linguistic reasons for actions and the types of reasons for actions made possible by the possession of language. So we have a variety of pre-linguistic reasons that we act upon, and often it's only when we are questioned or we, when we face trouble that we begin to articulate those reasons in ways that language makes possible and then to evaluate those reasons, okay? Uh, thank you.